सबै जनालाई नमस्कार मेरो प्रस्तुति आउनु भएकोमा धेरै धेरै धन्यवाद सुरुमा म रुख प्रतुष अनि सियर जीलाई विशेष धन्यवाद दिन चाहन्छु तपाईहरुको सहयोग र समर्थनको लागि धेरै धन्यवाद लगभग बाह्र तेह्र वर्ष भन्दा अगाडि म विद्यार्थी भएर नेपाल आएको थिएँ अनि थियो बेलामा मर्टन चौधरी सेमिनारमा आएको थिएँ अनि म राम्रोसँग याद गर्छु त्यसको सेमिनारको बारेमा राम्रोसँग याद गर्छु यहाँ प्रस्तुति दिने मेरो लामो समयदेखिको इच्छा थियो त्यसकारण आज मलाई धेरै खुसी लाग्यो अब म अङ्ग्रेजी बोल्न सुरु गर्न चाहन्छु त्यो को नाम भन्नुहोस् है तर आज मेरो प्रस्तुति नेपाल संविधान इतिहास सरी स्थानीय सङ्गीत र कर्थाग्राफीको बारेमा छ द टाइटल अफ माइ प्रेजेन्टेसन इज इनसाइड द कर्थाग्राफिक स्टेट लोकल म्यापिङ एन्ड द प्र्याक्टिस अफ कन्स्टिट्युसनल कर्थाग्राफी इन नेपाल द प्रेजेन्टेसन एज अ प्रोड्युस सेड इन्ट्रोड्युसेस अ पार्ट अफ माइ डिसर्टेसन प्रोजेक्ट which was an ethnography of state making and everyday negotiations of environmental and national belonging during and after the writing of Nepal's 2015 federal democratic constitution and while a key focus of my dissertation was the process of delineating provinces during constitution writing today i'm choosing to focus on a lesser understood cartographic phenomenon which accompanied Nepal's transition to federalism the mapping of local federal units in the two years after the promulgation of the constitution i'm sharing as pratush and sierra know an idea that's in progress um, that tries to link together cartography state making and the nepal constitution and i very much welcome your feedback as i develop this idea further so what i'm sharing today is a national story it'll be familiar to to everyone here probably but i'm choosing to tell it from the perspective of the place that i know best which is kailali district in the far west terai in kailali national debates over local federalism were made visible in public spaces such as the local government compound in the agrarian town of josipur which was the main site of my doctoral field work between 2016 and 2018 So I took this picture in March of 2017 and I like it and I wanted to start with it because it shows three different ways of organizing Kaivali's district space um that were circulating in the constitution writing period. And perhaps you've already spot, spotted all three, right? The first one on the ground is a new signboard that announces Josipur as a rural municipality. This rural municipality was Um, outlined in the Nepal Constitution and was designated at the conclusion of the local level restructuring commission's work um, earlier that same month in March 2017. The designation of a rural municipality replaced Josipur's earlier established identity as a village development committee, which is still visible on the lintel above the the main doorway. But also in this scene is a, another way of conceiving Josipur spatially. Does anyone see it? The writing might not be as clear as it once was, but painted on the wall above the Oh, yes. Yes. So painted yeah, above the signboard is a slogan that proclaims Josipur as part of the Tarahat Tarawan Autonomous Province. And as sure everyone is familiar with this was a demand of the indigenous Taro community in Kailali um that's associated with the Maoist People's War but was carried forward um stringently during the constitution writing period after 2007 so these different ways of demarcating Josipur were being worked out over the course of my field work and at the time i became intrigued by the coexistence of these different alternative imaginations of subnational order represented by the rural municipality, the VDC and the autonomous region. And was curious about what it meant to live this moment of combined spatial, social and political transformation. Later, as I revised or revisited my dissertation research for a book project, I started thinking more about how the constitution as an artifact of negotiations during constitution writing and a present-day guide for national policy and law has been engaged 
to map federal Nepal and what this reveals about contemporary state-making practices globally. So my interests and observations have brought me to interpret contemporary constitution writing in Nepal as a cartographic project, one that joined together the ideological restructuring of the state with a territorial reorganization of subnational space through nested scales of mapping at provincial and local levels. My interpretation echoes critical geographers and cartographic historians who have demonstrated how cartography, the science and practice of mapping, helped form the idea of the state, sorry, the ooh, sorry, helped form the idea of sovereign territorially based nation states. And Jordan Branch has a term cartographic state, which I think is a good shorthand for this mutualism between mapping and the rise and consolidation of territorial nation states. So from this basis, many scholars have examined how the act of drawing borders makes territory resources and populations legible to state actors for management and governance. So we can think of people like James C. Scott and Raymond Cripe. Other scholars have demonstrated how such exercises of spatial territorial ordering contribute to identity formation, both nationally, regionally, and sub-regionally. So people like Peter Salins, um, David Nugent, Townsend Middleton. Given the privileged, albeit understated, position cartographers have held in the life of the nation state, geographer J.B. Harley has argued that, quote, cartographers manufacture power. That is, that they generate subjects, bind objects, and foment social worlds in the filaments of representational space. As an anthropologist, however, I'm led to ask where, ethnographically speaking, can we see cartographers at work manufacturing state power? More importantly, who are these cartographers? And once we locate them, what tools are they using to create the social world that we experience and interpret as the nation state? So to answer, or to begin answering some of these questions, my presentation steps inside Nepal's cartographic state to trace the diverse individuals, instruments, and imaginations that contributed to the drafting of Nepal's local federal map. However, before I get much further, I want to just say that in focusing on the current constitutional moment, I'm not overlooking the longer history of cartographic practice in Nepal. So Nepal's internal space has been organized uh, and reorganized periodically, often to signify political regime shifts um, and to consolidate power for new governments. The map on, this, on the slide here is actually from a committee that was formed in 1962 to create uh, zones and development districts um, to set the foundation for the Panchayat government. So I'm not able to go into the details of this history during this presentation, but I'm really happy to talk about this um, at length during the Q&A after or over Chia or something. Just suffice to say that the administrative geography that was at the center of local mapping and local restructuring was a legacy of these earlier episodes of cartographic practice, and that made them at times very difficult to abandon when drawing the local federal map. So just to give us a starting point then, the contemporary cartographic state of Nepal that I'm interested in here arguably began with the Maoist state conflict in 1996 and the 2006 Comprehensive Peace Agreement, two events which excited territorial and spatial imaginations and set legal conditions for the restructuring of the state. So just briefly here then, the Maoist People's War, which was launched in 96, um, had the participation of marginalized peoples and ethnic groups that had historically been excluded from the state and who had been dispossessed of their territories in the building of the modern Nepal nation state over the um, 18th and 19th centuries. It was during this movement and this, and this period, excuse me, that ideas of regional autonomy were expressed by many communities um, in a way cap so in a way, drawing upon what Mukta Tamang has called territorial consciousness of indigenous peoples in Nepal. The Maoist People's War, or the Maoist State Conflict, formally concluded in 2006 at the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. 
The terms of this ceasefire was nothing short of the progressive restructuring of the state to eradicate inequalities based on ethnic, regional, and caste identities. And this was put into practice in the interim constitution of 2007, which laid out a path for achieving progressive state restructuring through constitution writing. Importantly, in February of that year, February 2007, under the influence of the Madesh Andalan, um, federalism was brought into the interim constitution through an amendment. And this gave a name to the political system that would scaffold progressive state restructuring. So when the Constituent Assembly formed in 2008, it became a, became a forum where ideas about how to restructure the state into a federal, federal republic were debated. And the focus on this time was really all about provinces, their criteria, their boundary, and their names, and also how to fit federalism into Nepal's diverse geography and society. And as we all know, this didn't, was not successful, and there was a second constituent assembly established the following year, and it did finish constitution writing, albeit um, in the aftermath of the Gorkha earthquake of April 2015, and amidst a wave of violent demonstrations against the constitution, and especially in certain locations against the proposed provinces, which did not reflect the aims for territorial recognition that had animated the progressive restructuring of the state in the first place. So when the Constitution of 2015 was promulgated, it had provinces um, delineated, but it did not have any of the local bodies delineated. It did, however, include a mandate for the formation of a local level restructuring committee, or commission, excuse me, to start within six months of the Constitution's promulgation. And there was a sense of urgency at this time for the, community, the commission to start its work because local elections were seen as the foundation for all further elections. And so without local units, there was basically all elections were stalled. So looking over just this overview of how cartography and the Constitution intersected um, from 1996, roughly 2006, to 2017, I identified two different phases of state restructuring. The first taking place during Constitution writing, which ended up forming provinces, and the second phase, which took place after promulgation and formed local bodies. And I think it's helpful to think of them in two different ways because they engage the Constitution differently. So in many ways, I see the significance of the Constitution to territorial state restructuring in Nepal fitting well with a global trend towards what I identify as constitutional cartography. So constitutional cartography, I would define, is a state-centered cartographic practice that engages constitution writing and constitutional interpretation to delineate and organize and manage state space. The, linkage is, the linkages between constitutions and cartography reflect a recent wave of territorially sensitive constitutional design that has taken place um, especially as part of devolved power or federal arrangements that have been entered into usually to resolve some kind of internal conflict or the threat of secession. So a number of newer studies on this are being done by scholars of international law, such as Tim, um, sorry, Tom Ginsburg, George Anderson, and Sujit Chowdhury. So in these cases, constitution writing has entailed defining territorial accommodations to repair cleavages in national society and fragments in state space. So in this framework, constitutions become cartographic instruments wielded to repair and strengthen territorial integrity, national identities, and sovereignty. So once this foundation is laid, whereby the Constitution is the arbitrator of spatial ordering, future decisions on the organization of the internal space of the nation state are made in reference to the cartographic vision that's outlined in constitutions. So in the case of Nepal, the cartographic power of the Constitution brought together a group of what I like to think of as unlikely cartographers. These are civil servants, politicians, and activists, amongst others, who unexpectedly find themselves enrolled in the weighty project of finalizing the map of federal Nepal after the Constitution's promulgation.
Interpreting the Constitution cartographically, however, is not a straightforward analytical objective process. It's not like you just replicate what's in the Constitution and bam, you have it on a map and it's done. It's really a subjective enterprise. And this has led me to think about the sifting through of the cartographic material of the Constitution and what geographies are left behind. In Nepal, this was special structures that were formalized in the Constitution and listed as part of the Local Restructuring Commission's mandate. However, they never moved from the Constitution's pages to the administrative map that we live in today. They remain suspended in the Constitution. But I like to think that these worlds, within worlds, are embedded in the Constitution and comprise a grounds where alternative futures for Nepal can be imagined, even if they're not yet fully lived. And I'll return to this, so special protected and autonomous areas. So I'll return to this idea of, the, of Nepal's heterotopic spaces at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to move now to examine constitutional cartography in practice. And I'll start by introducing the work of the Local Restruction Commission and their efforts to regulate and manage local mapping in reference to the Constitution's cartographic model. And I'll then explore how actors in Kailali took up this practice in the less pristine conditions of district space. And I'll show how it's in Kailali that we see special structures in particular being interpreted as compromises, as constitutional compromises to the demands of territorial recognition and autonomy that have been raised by indigenous groups during constitution writing. And it will come to terms with the near impossibility of actually implementing these structures in sites like Kailali where demands for identity-based provinces or were most vociferous and state-led suppression most acute during and after constitution writing. So as autonomous areas and other kinds of special structures disappear from the federal map, I'll discuss how they linger as heterotopia or counter spaces within the Constitution before offering some concluding remarks. And at this point, I want to just briefly clarify my own ethnographic position in this. So obviously, I'm a, um, a foreign researcher, and at the time, I was a student. And I had great institutional support from Tribune and the government um, to do this to do this research through my through my study visa. So I had lots of access to people who were on the local restructuring um, commission, for example. But understandably, as a as a foreign scholar and researcher, I wasn't allowed to sit in on meetings where the actual boundaries were being decided. Right. So like most Nepalis of the time, I had to interpret from a distance uh, what was happening and the reasons. Um, and understandings of why. So I'm grateful to many people who helped me to interpret constitutional cartography. And some of them are uh, pictured here, but two people who are not, and I don't think made it today, um, are Ujwal Prasai and Goro Casey. And I'm really indebted to their, to their help with this project. So moving on then to the ordering of subnational space. So the implementation of what I think of as phase two of state restructuring formally began on March 14, 2016 with the establishment of the Local Level Restructuring Commission. The commission was born out of Article 295.3 of the Constitution and was mandated by the Council of Ministers to finalize the federal map of Nepal by giving geographic form to the local bodies and special protected and autonomous areas referenced within the Constitution. They had a very short time period to complete this task, a one-year mandate only. And for the public and for many politicians, their mandate was broadly understood to consist of reducing the overall number of local bodies in Nepal from, at the time, 3,157 VDCs and 217 municipalities into a smaller set of administrative units that were considered to be more amenable to the power-sharing federal arrangement. To start, the LRC decided they would aim for between 300 and 500 of these units. But for Chairman Balananda Paudel, the gentleman all in black in the middle side of the, of the table, this goal needed to be met by asking larger contextual questions first. Namely, what is the purpose of local restructuring? What did the Constitution envision for local federalism? And how could the demarcation of local bodies and special structures help deliver on the Constitution's promise? 
The opening statement of the LLRC guidelines articulated restructuring's purpose to be bringing services closer to people, sponsoring development, increasing the comfort and amenity of local populations, and expressing pride or enabling the expression of pride in local identities. And above all, their guidelines uh, laid out that these new bodies should be meaningful for local people and exhibit cohesiveness and balance in geography, infrastructural capacity, and sociocultural life. To achieve this outcome of local restructuring, however, the LLRC members had to follow the Constitution's geographic structure. So what did this look like, just quickly? So some of these geographies were outlined clearly during the phase of Constitution writing, such as the seven provinces, as well as 77 districts. These boundaries, provincial and district boundaries, were off limits to the local restructuring commission. They could not change them in any way um, for the purpose of forming local bodies. At the local level, the Constitution did away with older forms like the VDC and municipalities and replaced them with new concepts of rural municipality and municipality. These were concepts only. They had not been delineated in any way, nor had there been any consensus truly during Constitution writing on their number and their criteria for demarcation. So in addition to the rural municipalities and municipalities, the Constitution also introduced a totally new geographic feature, the special structure. And I, sorry, I have it here as exclusive structure, but special structures. These structures did not fall in the three tiers of federalism. They were supposed to run parallel to it. The special structures included special areas, which would recognize um, localities where economically disadvantaged and geographically remote communities lived, protected areas, um, and these were supposed to be locations that had the presence of a minority group or an endangered language community, and lastly, um, and for many people most straightforwardly, autonomous areas. Um, these were localities with a clear majority of a single ethnic um, or caste group. Because borders for provinces and districts could not be disturbed constitutionally in local restructuring, mapping local bodies and special structures had to proceed within the parameters of district space. So this threw a curveball almost um, for a lot of people because it converted what was originally inferred into basically a district restructuring project. District space, however, was not empty space, right? It, had a rich administrative geography all its own. So we obviously have, this is a map of Kailali um, from just before local restructuring. So you can see all the different um, BDCs and municipalities. Within each of these BDCs and municipalities obviously were a number of different wards, the smallest unit of administration in Nepal. And then at the same time, there were clusters of VDCs and municipalities that created ilikas or sub-areas, for, um, for governance. So the LRC had to look at this administrative geography and figure out a way to make local mapping work given these um, distinct features. And they wanted to be able to create conditions that would regulate mapping across all 77 districts. So one thing that happened, I'll just mention briefly, was the designation of the ward as a building block for all local bodies. So while the boundaries for BDCs and municipalities would disappear from the maps, the wards remained, and you had to group together different wards to create new local bodies. So although this is not mentioned in the Constitution, it was decided upon and, and ratified in different documents um, by the LRC that were used for local restructuring. Um, and made the, the ward a principle of, of the actual local restructuring effort. So while the administrative geography presented an available set of variables for constructing local bodies, there was also the need to contend with the diversity of districts in terms of their cultures and environments. So this is, again, Kailali. Um, where you can see on the top um, the kind of spatial distribution of different ethnic and caste groups over, over the district. 
And then as well, um, just the bottom image is trying to convey, I'm not sure how clear it is, but that Kailali is not just Terai, it also is mountains, um, Churi. And so thinking about the geographical footprint of the district and how to work with that to create meaningful local bodies. So essentially to expedite the efficiency of this overall effort and to complete it within one year, the Council of, Minister, uh, Council of Ministers laid out bureaucratic channels for local mapping. So I already mentioned the local level restructuring commission, which had seven members, a chairperson, and a secretary that were based in Kathmandu. But the council ministers also saw, saw fit to create district technical committees that would basically devolve initial decision making on mapping boundaries to the districts. And the LLRC would then supervise the and support their work arbitrate map proposals coming in, and publish a final recommendation for local bodies and special structures. And it was understood that the DTCs would work really closely with different stakeholders in the districts to evaluate the models that they were considering and to achieve consensus. It was really important that consensus be made in the district before the proposals were even sent to the um, LORC. So this created the bureaucratic channel of work. So at this point, I'd like to turn now to how this organization of bureaucratic channels and different arithmetic for calculating and, um, and demarcating local bodies was taken up in Kailali. So the DTC was formed in Kailali in late spring 2016, and it was instructed by the LRC to create 10 local bodies. This was common. The LRC sent each district a guideline of a certain number of local bodies that they could work with. They couldn't go above or beyond that. So as a group, after receiving these instructions, the DTC decided that they would delineate four rural municipalities, five municipalities, and one sub-metropolitan city for Kailali. Of course, then it becomes, okay, so you have the numbers and you know now roughly what kind of designations you want, but where are they going to be? That was the big question. And although local restructuring opened interesting possibilities, the expediency of that timeline and the bureaucratic channels directing cartographic decisions brought a sense of confusion about what was to become of Kailali under the federal system. On the one hand, there was excitement about the prestige and resources that might come with being transformed from a BDC to a municipality. But would this imply higher taxes? The public was really unsure. And at the same time, designation as a special protected or autonomous area hinted at exclusive opportunities that on the surface appeared attractive Yet, for reasons that I'll sh soon um, talk through, they were not at all enticing to Taru activists in the district. So smoothing trepidations in Kailali was a person that I'm going to call Devendra Dev Koda, who was a program officer at the District Development Committee office. Mr. Dev Koda served as a go-between for local restructuring. Um, he served basically as a messenger between the DTC and the number of different consultants and GIS technicians that they were working with to create the map. He also organized all the community level events for discussing the proposals and trying to build consensus. And in this instance, he was responsible for fielding my questions about local mapping. So when I sat down with him at his office in August of 2016, he took out a hefty file folder from his locked storage cabinet to show me the feedback forms that he had gathered from BDC secretaries, intellectuals, and politicians. And he went through a litany of different meetings he had just recently completed and upcoming meetings um, that were scheduled to, um, to get more feedback. And by Devendra's account, the DTC was doing everything right to meet the LLRC's expectations for circulation of knowledge, transparency, and consensus building on the map proposals. So as a result of this, the DTC felt emboldened to prepare two maps for the LLRC. When I saw these for the first time, I struggled to distinguish what was, what was different what, between these two proposals. And they seemed basically to me to differ in the degree of connectivity between the hills and Terai between different local bodies. However, Devendra sidestepped my questions about disagreements that might have led to this two-map proposal. And instead, he highlighted what the two maps had in common. 
a proposed Taro Autonomous Area in the cluster of VDCs east of Dangari. So using the formula prescribed by the LRC, this local body, which is identified in yellow um, on one map and in green on the other, had a combined Taro population of 85% which meant that it easily met the LLRC's criteria for an autonomous area. And Devendra was confident that this was one unit that was unlikely to change from the draft to the final map. So we already saw that there was a target autonomous area in Kailali that was done. Devendra's optimism and, uh, and pride, really, in even finding one space for an autonomous area in Kailali might seem strange, um, given the earlier map showing the distribution of Tarus in the district, but it can really be understood in the context of the intense cultural politics of constitution writing and the violent suppression of indigenous Tarus demands for a Tarai-based province in Kailali at that point. The province that was created in the constitution for the far west um, mirrored the demands that were raised by Hill Origin Kailali residents because it in integrated the Terai as part of a Hill Terai province, um, integrated province. When I was there in August of 2016, a lot of the machismo around this was, was starting to sort of shift towards some regret, at least expressed verbal regret, um, at the violence that accompanied this resolution. And there was lots of talk about, well, maybe Tarus will be satisfied with a local body that is an autonomous area, right? And we can forget all of that unpleasantness, right, that had happened during constitution writing. There was also a lot of talk um, by folks on the periphery of the local mapping um, work that ethnicity should really be, quote, the last line of identity, not the first line for demarcating subnational space. Tarus, um, who had advocated for Taruhat, um, which would have separated the Tarai from the hills um, in, a, in its own federal province, did not share this line of thinking, quite frankly. And I met with a group of them um, shortly after my meeting with Devendra in August of 2016 at one of Dangadi's luxury hotels. And at that point, the hotel restaurant was unusually busy for a Friday morning and we had to carry our conversation quite loudly over the voices of everybody else in the restaurant. And as we discussed this post-constitution fate of a Taru province, a large group of men entered into the restaurant. And three of Kailali's most active Taru community members, um, community leaders I was meeting with, Paresh, Lal, and Prim, all pseudonyms, stood up really abruptly to greet them. And amidst their banter, the guests revealed that they were at the hotel to attend a program organized by the Dungadi Municipal Association to discuss local mapping. This shocked um, the Taro people that I was sitting with. It explained why the restaurant was so busy at that, time of, at that time of day, and the faces around my table stiffened. Prim yelled out to a journalist that was seated nearby, who was now revealed to be there to cover the event um, for, a, for a newspaper that he should report there that Taris had been excluded from the meeting. And he shouted to all the diners in the restaurant that his group would release a press statement about how Taris were being excluded from this and other local restructuring related events in the district. Finally, with much chair scraping and sour looks, uh, Prim and his colleagues returned to their seats and they vented their frustration um, to me, describing this feeling that the entire process of local mapping had been predetermined. Quote, Decisions are made at the top, said Law. They decide ahead of time how to cook the district, how to make it sweet. Nodding in agreement, um, the others at the table insisted that they had visited the district administration office to complain about the limited consultations that they had been um, invited to on local units. And they were suspicious that the criteria being used to create local units was designed to, quote, cut us apart to use the boundaries of local bodies to divide the continuity of Taru places. They stressed correctly that the DTC had been instructed to divide Kailali into 10 units and had no choice in the matter. And someone raised the point that if the units were smaller and therefore greater in number, 
there would be more areas with a clear Taro majority, and thus more Taro autonomous areas. Crucially, this statement did not mean that the men and women at my table supported the creation okay, supported the creation of protected special or autonomous areas. These structures were thought of as constitutional compromises. Quote, it's like they are taking one type of fruit from my basket and putting another in, law surmised. The feedback sessions at the VDCs, which presumably gave purchase to the idea of Taru autonomous areas, were seen as a sham in the eyes of my interlocutors. They were filled, as they said, with yes men, defined as teachers and unemployed people with nothing better to do than drink tea. Industrious people, who should be consulted, they argued, work and do not have the opportunity to give their thoughts in these forums. Because of the method of consultation and the manner of local restructuring, Paresh speculated that there could be another Taru movement. He said, quote, people know that their demand was for a province and they are being cheated by the government. So he said, if things continue as they are, there will be a secretary um, ruling over the 10 local units, will have his own authority and staff, and essentially it will be the same um, as it was during the Panchaya and Rana regimes when Kailali was controlled by bureaucrats, and the stagnation period um, after 2002 when elected representatives terms ended. So they ended the conversation by saying, quote, our democracy, our federal republic will go away on the wind, it will be but a dream. So for actors like Devendra, autonomy and the designation of special structures were approached as an intriguing puzzle, one in which ethnicity, as the last source of identity, had to be weighed in relation to infrastructural, geographic, and administrative criteria. If a local body presented itself as amenable to classification as a special protected or autonomous area, then it could be named as such. But in the first set of maps that were prepared by the DTC and shared with district stakeholders, delineating local bodies to create domains for ethnic autonomy was not seen as the main goal. However, by the LLRC's deadline for proposal submissions in August, September um, 2016, the DTC had shifted its position. So contrary to the LLRC's very straightforward instructions, Kailali's DTC submitted two maps. The first followed the LRC's exact guidelines and demarcated 10 local bodies. The second, in response to people's demands raised in the district and at VDC level consultation meetings, and likely helped along by the agitation of Taru activists, listed 13 local units, including one Fahadi autonomous area and two Taru autonomous areas. One, the same that featured on both of the previous maps, and another in Josiepur. The two maps produced by the District Technical Committee reached Kathmandu in mid-September 2016 and joined the growing pile of proposals arising from, arriving from the 77 other districts. So to expedite this work, Chairman Padel assigned LRC members to oversee restructuring according to the provinces each knew best. So there were seven members, coincidentally seven provinces, they each got a province. Responsibility for Province 7 fell to Lakshmi Chowdhury, a Taru politician from Kailali who grew up not very far at all from Josipur. She explained how she was brought onto the committee by saying, in the far west there was a demand for Taru Pahadi unity. The committee received the demand that they should have a Taru woman member, and hence she was brought on board. But the orderly procedures that had been put in place by the LLRC to regulate res the restructuring process were already under strain at this point. Population figures for the rural municipalities and municipalities had been revised in order to increase the overall number of local units. And this raised the target from its initial 300 to 500 to between 500 and 900. And I'm probably sure that everyone here remembers this back and forth over, over the number of local bodies. Eager to see the report finalized and plans laid out for local elections, political parties and the Nepal government abruptly changed the terms of reference for the LLRC, pushing for the ELICA, that subunit of districts um, administration, to be taken as the basis for local restructuring. And essentially this upended all the previous months of work. 
by the time the debate on making the ELICA the only basis for mapping, by the time that it subsided and the commission returned to evaluating the proposals that had been submitted by the DTCs, the deadline for the report submission was less than two months away. Proposals, however, from multiple districts in Province 2 had still not been received, owing to disputes over the number of local units that had been assigned to those districts by the DTC. At this point, advocate Sunil Ranjan Singh, the LLRC member assigned to coordinate restructuring for Province 2, resigned in protest. The remaining members worked through these challenges and submitted a first draft of the LLRC report in January 2017, and this recommended 719 local units. Um, unpopularly, they were able to do this by deciding amongst themselves what the local bodies would be for the different districts in province too, right? Many people were unhappy with this, um, including those in government, and they mandated that the report be revised and resubmitted. So in March 2017 it was, and local units were increased to 744. This was later amended um, to create a total of 753. None were listed as special protected or autonomous areas. So I'm getting close to the end now. So until the publication of the LLRC's final report in March 2017, it was fully expected that special protected and autonomous areas would be granted through local level mapping and restructuring. They were constitutionally guaranteed. They were there in the Constitution, so why were they not implemented? When Utwal and I spoke with um, Chairman Paudel about a month after the LLRC's um, term ended, he gave two reasons why these structures were not implemented despite being part of the LLRC's mandate. As a career civil servant, Mr. Paudel valued order and regulation and had tried to instill these principles in the local mapping process. For him, it was important that local bodies be ratified and determined before deciding which would be special protected and autonomous areas. He saw it as a two-step process. However, the delays in approving the draft proposal in January had meant that the LRC had no time to go into each of the districts and um, talk about the proposed special protected and autonomous areas. But more worryingly for him, despite his best efforts, there had still been considerable confusion about what a special structure even was. At the start, there was agreement that a local body, a municipality, or a rural municipality would be labeled special protected or autonomous. But midway through their one-year mandate, there was an idea to make wards within local bodies eligible for special structure status. However, however popular this idea was amongst um, those in, in government, the demographic data needed to make that determination was not disaggregated by ward. So essentially they had no reliable numbers to fall back on to try to figure out population statistics and infrastructural statistics and so on um, for creating special structures and wards. This compromised the orderly and regulated decision-making process that governed the bureaucratic approach to mapping. Or had the Constitution itself foreclosed a place for autonomy in federal Nepal. Lakshmi Chowdhury, who's seated at the far right um, in the purple cardigan in this press conference photo, took this view. She explained that if special areas, quote, had happened, it would have been good because the Constitution gives them. But they were so difficult to make. The Constitution was not clear, so it was hard to make any decisions. Even if an area had a majority of one population, Lakshmi reasoned, there was always the presence of other groups. In Kailali, quote, there are many Taru areas where we hear talk that this or that other group is not good, end quote. So in her opinion, special areas were only going to create social problems which the district did not need. Chairman Padel similarly stressed the Constitution's vagueness about special structures as a reason for wide-scale indifference. For him, the main the crux of the Constitution was social inclusion, and proportional representation was going to achieve that, not territorial recognition. The Constitution's silence on the relationship between extraterritorial constitutional commissions, like the Taru Commission, for example, and special structures, 
spoke to him that there was this ambiguity in the Constitution about their need and function. These were, he stated, quote, geographical units, not political units. Importantly, LLRC member Sunil Ranjan Singh argued persistently for the implementation of special structures as a constitutional right. So there was disagreement even within the commission about these structures and how much importance to, to give them in the, in the mapping process. Without special structures, territorial recognition and autonomy, which had been driving forces for state restructuring, officially fell out of Nepali federalism. And I see this as disenfranchising many indigenous Dalit and caste communities who are now without a province or a local body that's reflected of their territorial belonging and attachments. So remembering back to the um, Akhanda Sudarpashtim movement and the province that clearly expressed the belonging between the Tarai and Hills that um, people there who were of Hill origin really felt at that time. So I argue that this outcome occurred in the context of competing interpretations of the Constitution's cartography, the allure of past administrative structures as expedient political solutions to a protracted bureaucratic um, mapping process, and grassroots apathy about the powers and potentials of special structures in comparison to the perceived strength of provinces. This does not dismiss or undercount wider social practices of exclusivity, um, as well as communal and state-directed violence that were also at play at this time. Rather, I'm really just trying to show how the Constitution enacted and substantiated power at local and national scales through cartographic practice. Yet I'll end optimistically by saying that even as special structures lie dormant in the Constitution, they remain, I think, productive countersites for imagining a different Nepal state. Interpreting special structures as constitutional countersites um, engages Foucault's concept of the heterotopia. What he defined as, quote, a kind of effectively enacted utopia in which the real sites, all the other real sites that can be found within the culture are simultaneously represented, contested, and inverted. I suggest that a reason why special structures remain suspended within the Constitution is because they reflect real sites of the Nepal nation state, albeit ones that, while important to the country's cartographic history, are critical of its normative unitary interpretation. These sites include models for identity-based provinces and autonomous regions, which dominated discussion of federalism within the first phase of restructuring. They also recall the numerous indigenous polities which preceded the consolidation of the modern Nepal state. And also they conjure up the magnetism of self-governing localities, invoking strands of Nepali political thought that elevate the idea of self-sufficient autonomous communities in the face of a centralized state. Since the publication of the LLRC's report, there has been one documented legal attempt that I'm aware of to compel the creation of special structures. So in 2017, the Baramu of Gorkha district petitioned the Supreme Court to force the government of Nepal to implement a special area for their community. The Supreme Court favored their peti petition and instructed the government to do so, to provide a special area for the Baramu. However, the government of Nepal has so far ignored the Supreme Court's decision, and to date there has been no further attempts that I know of to implement these remaining features of Nepal's constitutional geography. So we can see in this way that special structures are replete with symbolic power as well as political potential. For the actors enrolled in the second phase of restructuring, they were forced to grapple with the latent possibilities represented by these special structures. And for the reasons outlined already, they essentially abandoned them. It was, it was too, um, too sensitive and, and too, too charged. Yet I argue that they have not been lost, they're only dormant in the Constitution. They remain constitutionally real. They're there as a, as a resource. They offer a platform for thinking about Nepal differently than the way, the way that Nepal is presently um, signaled on the national map, and they live on as references for potential future political transformation in Nepal. So I'll end now by saying just a few remarks. First, that thinking about the Constitution as a cartographic instrument is, at least for me, liberating because it sees the Constitution as mediating social and spatial ordering and is a tractable tool 
for state remaking that is reflective of the uptake of territorial sens sensitive constitution writing globally. So we can see this happening in Nepal, but it's part of a larger international process of territorially sensitive constitution design, especially in post-conflict states, so-called post-conflict states. It also has given me, at least, an ethnographically tractable process to discern state making in practice, something to follow. And it democratizes the idea of state cartography by showing how a range of different actors in, are engaged in this delineation of social and spatial order. So it's not just GIS trained technicians working with, um, with computer programs, it's actually a whole range of people thinking about the best way to organize space in society. But thinking about this cartographic practice also makes me reflect on the subjective nature of constitutional interpretation. And some geographies do get left behind in the constitution. And they consist basically as worlds within the world of the constitution where alternative features of the state are imagined. But we might start to gesture towards how they are already lived. Spaces that qualified as special, protected, and autonomous areas are instantiated as local bodies. They just don't have that designation. So Josiepur is a really good case in point because it was listed formally in the DTC's proposal to the LRC as a target autonomous area. But it just is not listed that way on any official documents because that part of the LRC's work was not um, officially sanctioned in the final report. I was able to visit Josiepur last week um, for the first time since 2018, thankfully. And one of the things I noticed was that even if Josiepur is not listed as a Taro Autonomous Area, the idea of Taro Hot Taroan still lives on very, very strongly there. So as some of you may already know, um, Russian Chowdhury's Nagari Unmukti Party swept the elections for mayor and deputy mayor in Josiepur. So at this point, at least, there is a political commitment to the idea of Taro Hot Taroan um, instantiated in, in Josiepur. So we might see um, in future, some of these ideas of special protected and autonomous areas being being revived. So I feel like I talked for too long, so I'm going to stop now. Thank you really for your attention. Um, I'm happy to answer any any questions, and I really look forward to your feedback. So, thank you. Thank you.